Good morning, First Church. Did anybody come ready and excited to worship the Lord this morning? Come on, come on. Happy New Year. This is a new year, a new season, a new time. Believe God's going to do something very new in this house. If you believe it, I want you to just lift your hand and your voice and shout into this new year. Jesus, we love you, Lord. Praise be to God, who always causes us to triumph in His name. Praise be to God, who always causes us to win. Yeah. Praise be to God, who always causes us to triumph in His name. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. We have overcome. Hallelujah.
Say it's a new year. How far have your other neighbors say it's a new season? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I believe so strongly that this whole entire world is trying at the beginning of the year, even at the at the tail end of last year, they've been trying to tell you who you think, who they think you should be. So many people have been telling us who they think that we should be. So many of us have been in the struggle of figuring out who we are. But I want to put a decree and a declare out in the in in the atmosphere. I think that we can declare exactly who we are going forth this year. So with that being said, I wonder how powerful it would be for us to declare to this world, to this nation, to this city, to one another, to everybody that I am a child of God. I am a child of the King. I was bound, I was lost, but He set me free. He put His blood in my veins. He put His Spirit in my heart. He put His Spirit inside of me. He put His Word in my mouth. He put His power inside of me. I am a child of God. If you believe that, I want you to shout it. A child of God, I am. I believe it. Here we go. Come on, come on. I believe it. I was lost. I was bound. Couldn't find a solid ground. I was blind. Couldn't see how you call me on your team. But in just three days, you came and rescued me. Oh, oh, oh. By the power of your blood, I am left and I am free. And who the sun sets free is truly free. Come on.
my strength. Yeah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I don't know what to do. When I'm as weak as I am. When I'm as weak as I can be. All I have to do is start doing the things that give God joy. Promises are yes and amen. Meaning that if he said it, he's going to do it. There are promises in the word of God. I want every eye closed, every hand lifted. There are promises in the word of God that we need to cling to right now. The promises of the Lord that, that, that he'd never leave us. That he'd never forsake us. David said, I was young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his seed begging bread. I promise he'd always take care of us. As long as we delight ourselves in the things of the Lord. There are promises of God that we're clinging to right now. Wonder right now, I want you to begin to call out those promises in the word right now. Whatever promises that you need, the promise that, that, that he'd go with us through the fire, that he'd be on the side of us, that he'd be all around us, that he'd protect us, that he wouldn't tempt us past a, a point that, that there's no way of escape. Come on, I want you first church to start claiming the word right now. Come on, do you have some word inside of you? I want you to begin to, to pray the scriptures right now. Come on, we've got a little bit of time today. It's a brand new year. It's a brand new season. Come on, come on. Claim those promises. Claim the word of God right now. Hey, though I walk through the valley of a shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff will comfort me. Thou prepares the table before the presence of my enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Come on, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Come on, that's it. That's it. This is this is this is what we need. This is what we need right now. The power and the presence of the word of Almighty God. Every word that He has spoken. Somebody in this place came here looking for a word. I'm here to tell you, we've got 66 books of his word. I want you to begin to use that word right now. That ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you.
just one more time. Can we sing that one more time? We are standing so to us he said behold I will do a new thing you see I'm thankful for God's track record I'm thankful that I can look back in my past and in your lives and say well you know what if God did it for them he can do it for me but God promised he says I'm not just a God of what's familiar I'm not just a God of what's been done I'm a God of the impossible I'm the God of something that's never happened before. I can do that again, but I can do a new thing. So in this moment on holy ground, I wonder, I wonder if there's something that you've never had the courage. You've never had the courage to ask God for. Maybe the prayer or the request has been too great for you to even speak it. God is here to remind us. He will do a new thing in your life. Find that courage to pray that prayer as we go before God for the, for the prayer request in this room represented on the screen behind me. How about we get bold in the Holy Ghost in 2023 and start making some proclamations that God is for us and He is not against us. Mighty Lord, we trust You. God, I thank You, Lord, that You are a God of yesterday, today, and forever. God, I know that I, I can put all my confidence in you because you've never failed. You have no desire and you cannot even begin to become failure because you are success. You are victory. You are triumph. So Lord, I prophesy today to this crowd that you are for them and not against them. That this will be a year of blessing and not of cursing. That this will be a year of harvest and of reaping, Lord, and not of sowing. For we have sown, mighty God. This is a year of reaping in this church. Mighty Lord, I pray God today that your healing touch would fall upon your people. God, that you would move through this room from one wall to the other wall. God, let your spirit be stirred in this room today. God, touch every need, heal every mind, restore every soul, God. Comfort, mighty God, every emotion, every insecurity. God, every ounce of anxiety, mighty Lord, we put it at an altar. We lay it at your feet knowing, God, that you're with us and that you're for us in this year. Mighty Lord, we put our hands together in faith and confidence with hearts of gratitude because you will do a new thing this year. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a great way to start out the new year. I'm so thankful to be here. As you make your way back to your seats, if you are a guest in the room today, thank you so much for coming out. We trust that you are having a wonderful time with us here at First Church. And to all of our guests and our First Church family online, thank you for tuning in and being with us today. We trust that you are feeling the presence of God in your rooms or wherever you're at, the, the way that we are feeling this presence in the sanctuary today. Looking forward to tomorrow night, we have a value that says prayer is our anchor, and we're not going to stop praying. First Church, we're not going to stop praying. We believe so strongly in prayer, and we gather every Monday night at 7 o'clock to gather corporately in the sanctuary where God meets us, and we come expecting great things. So be with us tomorrow night. 
And uh, as you notice in our lobby, we are having our life group sign-ups today. Who's excited about our life group semester this, this winter? And there's different groups out there. Find something that interests you. And uh, we believe here at First Church in living life together. You're not made to live in isolation. That's a lie of the devil. So when you feel that way, you feel like you're alone, just that's a lie. Get connected to God and the body of Christ. Sign up for a life group, and uh, it'll, it'll help you live out your day-to-day life. Everybody needs somebody. And, and that's what we believe so strongly here at First Church. So sign up for those life groups. Uh, we also believe strongly in serving around here, and we have something called Growth Track. Happens on the third and the fourth Sunday of every month. We just want everybody to get connected. We want everybody to join up onto a serve team because God has given you a gift. He has given you a talent that you can use to help grow the kingdom of God here in Sterling Heights. So go through Growth Track if you're not connected or plugged into a serve team, and that'll happen on the third and the fourth Sundays of every month. And now we are, we are excited because we're looking into the new year. And of course, our custom here is at First Church, we, uh, we start the new year outright, of course, with prayer, but also with fasting. And so who's excited to start our 21 days of prayer and fasting? Listen, anything worth doing, if it's hard, it's worth doing. Fasting is hard. It's incredibly hard. But I believe it changes the trajectory of our church, and it helps your life. So fasting will begin this Tuesday on the 3rd, so it gives you a few days to enjoy all your New Year's leftovers, and uh, so we'll, we'll start that on Tuesday, January 3rd. That brings us up to today. We are enjoying an amazing presence of God in the room, but today is not only the first Sunday of 2023, but it is Let's Imagine Sunday. Who's excited about Let's Imagine Sunday? And so it's my privilege. I would like to invite Brent Campbell up to the up to the platform today. Brent has done an amazing job keeping us updated and current with all of our Let's Imagine uh, numbers. So Brent, thank you so much for serving and uh, get us up to speed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Pastor John, it's the first time this year that I've been disappointed. Um, I thought for sure Pastor John would come up here with some really cool slogan for 23. No, nothing. You know, like victory in 23 or, or be the best you can be in 23. Uh, it's a little lame, but, you know, that'll work. Um, you know, from time to time, we highlight a certain serve team at First Church during our campaign update. And today we're going to highlight our production team. Um, how many people here... Work in the medical field. You're a nurse, you're a doctor, you're a phlebotomist, you're an ER, ambulance driver. Raise your hand, Bianca. Okay, somebody. There you go. Several. We want to thank you for your service. That's, that's a tough job. It's a real tough job. It takes a lot of hours and many years of training to become a nurse. And some nurses get into specialties that require additional training. If you're in the ER for per se. You see everything. You see people that shouldn't even be there because they have a cold, or you have people in there that have life-saving requirements that are needed. And um, imagine if you're in that ER situation, there's teams of people to help you. There's rooms. There's incredible equipment around you to make sure you do your job the best you can do it. Now, take it a step further. Do this while riding in a helicopter. It's a whole different ball game in a helicopter. The man I'm about to in- introduce to you does this with excellence. I know I would trust him in an emergency situation. This man works 12, 24, even 36 hour shifts on call at the Oakland Troy Airport. He's away from home a lot. His wife also works very hard in the financial investment sector. They have th- three children. Uh, being a certified flight nurse, husband and dad takes a lot of time. He does this with excellence, as well as leading our production team. Ladies and gentlemen, our friend and the production team leader, Jeremiah Gibbs. Wow. (laughs) Uh, That was something. Uh, Thank you, Brother Campbell, for the introduction. Wow, we're full, guys. We're full. That's 
Um, the view I usually have is from the sound booth, and I see all your pretty, the back of your heads. But there's a lot of faces here that I don't have names for, and uh, that's a sign that we're growing, and I'm grateful to be a part of that. Um, as we normally do when we're planning for these services, I had an opportunity to talk to Brother, Brother Brent about what we were going to be talking about today. And I kind of threw him off guard when I asked him a question. I said, you know, which one of the 12 disciples do you think was Jesus' production director? And he kind of laughed and he thought I was joking, but, you know, having done this for 27 years um, in the production team, I knew one of those guys told Jesus, hey, you know that beatitude thing you're going to do? Why don't you go do it from the mountain because you'll be up and your voice will carry a little further. And then the Colin will like this because I'm sure the same guy probably said, you know, Jesus would be really cool if you got in that boat, pushed out from shore a little bit, and the sun's coming down, the light will hit off the water, we'll have a great ambiance for you message that you're going to preach on the water. And uh, Brother Greg, the truth is it was probably Judas. He <laughs> he carries all the money and spends it all anyway, right, Pastor? Right? So it's, this stuff costs a lot. Costs a lot. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Gibbs, and it's been an honor and continues to be an honor to be the production director here. And uh, to my knowledge, what I'm about to do is throw a curveball to everybody in the room, and has never been done in the history of First Church that I know of. And uh, hopefully Pastor Hoffman will forgive me, but uh, I want everyone in the production booth to take the day off. I think we're going to go the rest of the service with uh, no production team. So why don't we go ahead, Matt, just go ahead and turn these lights off. Why don't we just pull up the house lights and get it kind of bland in here. And, and then um, Brian's back there running the overhead. Yeah, kill that. We're not going to need that. And Karen, I don't know if everybody knows, but Karen Blankenship is the longest serving volunteer here at First Church. Absolutely. And um, it's been just a joy to work with her. And Steve, who's running our sound today, you can come on out there too. I don't think anything's going to happen if we uh, take a little step away. Uh, these guys do an amazing job. And really uh, tirelessly most people would think that the production team shows up on Sundays they show up on Wednesdays and maybe Monday night prayer but the truth of the matter is that behind the scenes daily weekly this team is serving and ministering in this department it would be um, an oversight for me not to mention the fact that every wedding and every funeral every conference special event live recording any time that we've had to support a, a, a team here at the church the production team has been there and uh, if you come here at about 11 o'clock at night during the week there's a good chance that you'll find Aaron Davey here tweaking compressors and equalizers. You may find uh, Matthew Cothran or Mo here. Um, you'll find them working and entering in lyrics. Um, Steve, uh, sorry, dude. Can, yeah, I'm in a box up here. Has anyone heard that? I'm in a box up here. Can you fix that for me? In fact, uh, I have a graphic. Um, Steve. Steve. <laughs> all the things that fall in the umbrella of the production team. Uh, sound, staging, media, of course, the live stream and lighting. Um, lighting. Lighting. Um, who's my li Matthew? Can you just recall? You know, just go, guys. Just recall all the settings. Everything stored. Announcement scene lighting. Please recall the board. Fix everything. This is. I can't handle this. You don't get the day off. No more days off. That was a terrible idea. Terrible idea. Terrible. Ah, it's better. Feels better like church in here now. What does the production team do? I've really tried to focus on what that is, and it really comes down to two things. The job of the production team is the best that we can mitigate any distractions. Um, and the second thing that we do is we're a ministry of helps. Often you'll find us behind the scenes in that little cave back there in the dark and the shadows, and that's where we're comfortable. And it's very uncomfortable for me to be up here but the truth of the matter is, is that we provide a, a, a foundation of help to the pastoral team and 
to the praise and worship team. And I, I got to tell you, is it okay if I just brag for a second on our, on our team? Because pastors Draylon and Kelsey Young, they are the best in the game at what they do. And it's not, all right, that's okay. And, and it's not because they sound good when they sing, but it's because when they come here, they've prayed and they know how to step into the spirit of God and flow with that and lead us into praise. It's different than just getting up here and singing versus ministering and serving the Lord through his giftings and returning that back as a sacrifice. And I appreciate that so much. And the band is incredible, and the praise and worship team is so gifted. And I don't know if you know, but having worked with them for so long, that praise and worship team is asked to travel and be on live recordings and sing with other worship pastors and other places. And these are the volunteers, the people that we have just here. And how could I not even mention Pastor Hoffman, the greatest Bible teacher of our age? It truly is incredible, the people that we get to serve with. And we look forward on Imagine Sunday to the new campus and this addition that we're putting off here to the north. It really is going to impact the production team in incredible ways. If you look up here at the staging, I've really enjoyed the Christmas decor that we've been having. But the truth of the matter is, um, if Sister Charmaine wanted to add more wreaths, probably, because we did it, we're going to be tripping breakers all through the hallway because every drop, every ounce, every watt and amp is being sucked and filtered and everything that you see. And this building is no longer able to support the vision. <laughs> we're out of inputs. We can't add any more microphones, any more instruments. Brother Draylon, how many years have we fought dropping microphone frequencies for our in-ears and our wireless? And the new building is going to solve all those problems. When I started in the production team in this ministry, there were two of us in the back, and it rotated. But really, the job, it was a job. Somebody recorded the service, and the other one just made sure it didn't get too quiet in here. The production team has grown to over 20 members, and the thing that has catapulted production from a job has been the live stream. Live stream has changed the way we do church. And I tell Pastor Mike sometimes we talk about the 915, we talk about the 1130, but there's a third service that happens every week too, and that's the virtual service online. And I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube or been on social media, we're growing our live stream presence, and it's weekly that we hear about the amazing things that are happening on the live stream that goes all around the world. And we're commanded to preach this gospel to the whole world. You could have a thousand Pastor Hoffmans, you could have a thousand Pastor Nettos, a thousand Pastor Draylons, and not to contain what they do, but the truth is, it wouldn't be enough to touch this whole world. And as much as the enemy of our soul would use the internet and the conduit it brings to distribute information to this whole planet, to distract you, to tempt you, to bring you into a place that you would be taken away from the blessing that God has for you. I truly do believe that it's through those means that the, the modern day church is going to reach this nation, reach this country, reach this world. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Touch this world. In fact, today, um, not to embarrass him, but we met Anthony and Jessica out in the hallway, and I said, how you know, how, how you been doing? And he said, well, we've been coming two weeks. We've been to Monday Night Prayer, but we just Googled Holy Ghost Church. And first church popped up, and they watched the video, and he told me we felt something there. I'm not going to limit God to these walls and to what my perception of how God wants to touch people. I got the Holy Ghost right there 23 years ago, uh, nearly 30 years ago. Brother Harry Primmy, right through to the Holy Ghost right there. We didn't have any lights. I didn't have LEDs. There was no haze. There was, the sound was mediocre. The songs were old. God doesn't need all this production stuff. But the truth of the matter is, is that this supports the vision of the guests to come. You can't catch the fish without a shiny lure. And this isn't all about us all the time. And I know some of us like it, some of us don't. But the truth of the matter is, we're here to seek and save that which is lost. Seek and save what's lost. So imagine, it's going to move us into a new position, a new opportunity for this message, this vision to be cast all around the globe, even more than it already is. And I promise you that as that vision is fulfilled, and I believe it will be, we're going to all see that when it happens. My kids are going to grow up in a building and in a church that's going to be able to reach 
and harvest this community and this nation and this, this, this county that we're in. I would ask you today on Imagine Sunday, the first day of the year, as we move into 21 days of prayer and fasting, to take time to pray about your commitment. Relive the zeal that we had nearly a year ago. Recapture the excitement about what we're trying to do, about doing our part. God's going to do his part, but look at what we're doing and what you're doing. Did you get a Christmas bonus? You planning your vacation? I know I'm planning my vacations, but what can I sacrifice? Have we been faithful in what we're doing? And as Brother Brent comes back up here, he's going to tell us where we are and where we are. Is, it's incredible where we're at. But we got more to go. Examine yourselves and pray about your commitment and see what God will do with your sacrificial giving. Wow. Wow. I don't have to say another thing. <laughs> I feel like I've been to church this morning. It's, that was great. Wonderful, wonderful job. You know, our campaign is moving quite fast. And when I thought about this campaign update today, I thought about 2023 and the milestones that we're going to hit this year. It's going so fast, it's, it's ridiculous. But next month is our quarter. We're 25% done next month. It's hard to believe. Um, we'll pass the one-year mark in May. We'll pass the halfway point at the end of November of this year, halfway home. And with your help, we will surpass our $2 million mark, uh, which would be a wonderful milestone to hit. Um, if the ushers would come. Our, uh, our campaign total, slide please, over eight months, $1,172,075.47. We appreciate... We appreciate all you do. And, and your sacrifice. Um, if you'd st remain standing. Um, to be honest with you, my wife and I for years would dread the new year. Because all the failures we had the, the year before. We didn't do this right. We didn't do that right. We could have been better here. It's like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to hit a new year. Because we just, we just could have done better but 2022 is now in the rearview mirror the potholes in the road are behind us the places in our lives where we fell short are also behind us we could stand on our victories for 2022 and build on them for 2023 we're going to have a successful year in God because he's going to ordain it folks help us build a church and the church really is just us it's people there's a whole world of lost people around us and the crazy thing is, most of them don't even realize it, that they're lost. Together, help us love God, learn the word, live the life, and be vessels where God can shine through us and we can reach the lost. If you're a guest today, if you're looking for a church home, or you're interested in joining our campaign, and you haven't made that commitment yet, you want to know more about it, please see one of our pastoral team members. Because we're going to build a new structure to worship God, we're going to lead the lost, and we're going to build community. And this happens, we could be in our new building 40 months from now if, we, if everything works out. So let's take an offering. If you would, if you'd come. Jesus, it's the new year. It's the first day. The first time we can praise you. It's the first time we can worship you. The first time we can thank you. And it's the first time for us to give this year. Lord, bless this offering. Let this year be a remarkable one. That at the end of the year, we can look back and say it all started out with giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Taste and see in 23.
okay? Do, do, do. Yeah, that's good. I think we're done. Thank you. I'm done. Well, good afternoon to all of you. It's an honor to be here with you today. I was very deeply moved with, with Jeremiah's comments. Jeremiah, you did an excellent job. Excellent job. Never thought of it the way he framed it, but we, we really do three services every Sunday. Three times this week, I've had people from various places across the country text me to thank, to thank me and to thank the team for, for the live stream. Um, right now, while you and I enjoy this room, uh, Ann and Mark Curtis are standing in their living room watching this thing, doing everything they can from a distance to be a part of this church family to both of you. We, you're going to be back with us this year. And we look forward to having you in this place with all of us. I, I could go on and on and on. I have wonderful relatives to Ronnie and Sandy and thank you for all your kindness and um, to Sister Hudson that's uh, sitting in the living room with her with her husband Tommy you were good to me and I, I'll never forget your kindness to me in Arizona and uh, I'm just grateful uh, as you possibly can and probably can't imagine how many moving parts there are in this machine every week to see that it succeeds. And um, I, I, it's, I don't have the adequate words to be able to thank all of the teams and all of the leaders and all of the people who tirelessly work here week after week after week with no thanks, with no pay. There, Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of my Father. And I've got meat to eat that you don't know anything about. And that's the kind of servants and servant leadership that makes this thing work week after week because these people don't, sure don't do it for the pay. And they sure don't do it for the thanks because they don't get them often enough when you go by that nursery and pick up your children, you thank those people because they've, they've had stinky fingers and uh, from, your, from your daughter's diaper and uh, they've wiped up uh, the uh, misdirected water from your little boy who uh, said, we aim to please, you aim to please. And uh, it's just... Uh, just amazing, amazing. And uh, I'm deeply moved. I really am. I'm deeply moved. Would you stand with me, please? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to have communion at the end of this service. It's always a very special time. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. I, I, my subject today is what God calls a new year. What God calls a new year. God bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> I guess one way to look at it is it, it all started with the fulfillment of a dream. In 
Genesis 42 and verse 9, it says, And Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed of them. According to Genesis 37 and verse 2, Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold by his brothers to a slave merchant on his way to Africa. I know in Genesis 41 and 46 that he was 30 years old when he finally stood in front of Pharaoh and gave the interpretation of the dream that had so troubled this king. And if you're a student of the Bible, you know what the dream was. Seven fat cows came out of the river, followed by seven skinny cows, and the seven skinny cows ate up the seven fat cows. That wasn't all that he dreamed. He he had another dream of seven different good things and seven terrible things. Joseph helped him understand. You're going to have seven years of blessing and plenty in your farms. But then there's going to come a famine that's going to be worldwide. And that famine is going to last for seven years. It's obvious when you read chapter 45 and verse 6. Joseph unveiled himself and revealed himself to his brothers in the second year of the famine. So if he was 30 years old when he told Pharaoh what was about to happen, then he had to be 39 years old when he revealed himself to his brothers. I've been in prisons through the years, been in a lot of jails, but I've been in some very, very terrible prisons in my travels. I uh, was preaching in Tennessee one time when a lady just came in that nobody knew and received the Holy Ghost. She was the wife of James Earl Ray who was accused of of killing Martin Luther King. And of course, she swore that he didn't do it. And uh, James Earl Ray was uh, just a pretty much a common street thief. So my question was, how in the world did they catch James Earl Ray in London, England with all of that money? No one else was ever charged. They blamed it all on him. Several years later, I met a man who was involved in the prison ministry of the United Pentecostal Church. He had spent six years in a cell with James Earl Ray. And I asked him, did he do it or not? I'll never forget what he told me. He said, Brother Hoffman, There's truth behind the bars. And he said, uh, James Earl Ray didn't shoot Martin Luther King. And then he said something I'll never forget. He said, you have to learn to throw away hope when you go to prison for life. Because hope will kill you when there's no possible chance of what you're hoping for to be realized. So I wondered, when when did he forget? When when did he lose it? Was it on the trip to Egypt, chained to who knows how many other poor souls on their way to a slave auction in Egypt? Or was it the time spent as a slave in a wealthy Egyptian's home by the name of Potiphar. And just when you think it couldn't get any worse than being a slave, 
Joseph ends up in prison probably for the rest of his life on a trumped up rape charge. I suppose it is a combination of those things that had thoroughly stomped out any hope in his heart that he would ever catch a break. Twelve years of dream-crushing setbacks followed by a miraculous series of events that literally promoted him overnight from the prison to prime minister. He made the transition. Egypt was his home now. He had resigned himself after all of the ill luck and terrible things that had happened to him. Um, I'm going to take advantage of my good fortune and I'm going to milk this one for all it's worth. And so as he gazed over that room that day, crowded full of men with their hat in their hands, all there for the very same reason, we're hungry and you have the only grocery store in the world. I don't know when exactly it happened, but he saw him. When those 10 men walked in the back of that room that day, Judah, you've gotten gray since I saw you last. Reuben, I wouldn't know you anywhere. The awareness came on him. His heart rate begins to rise. It's them, all 10 of them. And then it happens. He remembers the dream. He knew that when their number was called, they're gonna come up here and they're gonna bow down in front of me, just like those bending sheaves and those orbiting stars that I saw years ago. He would unveil himself in front of them. Their knees would shake as they realized the man they had convinced their dad was dead was in fact sitting in front of them right now and he had (coughs) all of their tomorrows in his hand. And in what to me is the greatest act of forgiveness that would only be eclipsed By the last words of Jesus on the cross, Joseph said to those brothers who had sold him, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. I've always smiled when I've read this verse. It's in Genesis 47 and Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. First question Joseph asked his brothers, is daddy still alive? Yep, he don't walk very fast right now and he's had both of his knees replaced. His hips are in trouble. He's got arthritis. He doesn't hear real good. Miracle here sends him something in the mail every week. But he's still alive, Joseph. You go get daddy and everybody else and you bring them down here. And it was with great pride that Joseph presented his dad to the king that ruled the greatest nation in the world at that time. Boy, what I have enjoyed being there and listening to that conversation between Joseph's dad and Pharaoh. That boy of yours is something else. You know, the locals have a nickname for him. They call him the savior of the world. I couldn't have pulled this off without your boy. It all started out so good. The favor of the Pharaoh himself 
Jacob getting to meet two grandsons that he didn't even know existed. The best farmland you could ever ask for. The best farmland probably in the world. The fertile crescent of the Nile River. The Bible said in Exodus 1 and verse 5, it all started out with 70 souls. There's a little scrap of information that you'll find in Galatians chapter 3. It says that they were there in Egypt for 430 years. Everything was good until it says there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. 300 years. It just stuns me. This nation is not 300 years old. How many people remember George Washington? Well, all the the foolish, woke. I can't get sidetracked with that. You can't change history, ladies and gentlemen. You can study it. You can hate it. You can love it. But it's there. You can't change it. What kind of life do you live that for 300 years after you're dead, you're still influencing national policy? Joseph was an amazing, amazing man. But after 300 years, finally, there got to be a Pharaoh who never met Joseph had no idea who Joseph was, could care less. It always fascinated me because it says there's more of them than there are of us. If they ever come to the awareness of who they are and what they're capable of, they literally can overthrow us. That's not what Israel said about Egypt. That's what Pharaoh said about Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, if the church ever figures out who they really are, wow. if they ever come to the understanding, I remember being in India years ago seeing a massive elephant tied with something based that wasn't even what my mom would call clothesline material. It was just a simple little braided string, really. I asked that guy, how in the world could you chain up an elephant with that tiny little string? And he said, we start when they're young. And he said, they try and try and try to get away. But after a while, they just accept it. And so now we can chain up a massive elephant with a tiny little string because he gave up. Just come to the understanding, I'll I'll never get loose. If the church ever gets the revelation of who she really is, we can throw off the restraint and we can have a harvest and a victory unparalleled in the history of the work of God. Oh, Jesus. 150 years of slavery. That's three generations at least. You're a slave. Your dad was a slave. Your grandpa was a slave. But all that starts changing in Exodus 11 and 12 in something known as the plagues. Exodus 12 is the final plague, the death of the firstborn. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment because I'm the Lord. 
And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Watch. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord through your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. I will try. I don't mean to confuse you, but you're going to have to follow me for the next 15 minutes. Because you have to understand the future ramifications that these events preview. This thing known as the Passover is a big There are seven feasts of Jehovah mentioned in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. Here are the first three. In the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. Verse six is the very next feast. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you have to eat unleavened bread. Verse 10 says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. These are the three, the first three feasts in the seven. Feast number one was known as Passover celebrated on the 14th day of the first month. The second feast was known as unleavened bread, celebrated on the day after Passover. The third feast is known as first fruits. It begins on the day after unleavened bread. Three feasts in succession. 14th is Passover. 15th is unleavened bread. 16th is first fruits. This is what makes 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, one of the reasons it makes 5 and 7 so powerful to me. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. When you read the letter to the Corinthian church, In 15 and 20, Paul said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits and afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. These are words that mean nothing to you if you aren't familiar with the feast. When you call Jesus Passover, that's a big deal. When you call Jesus first fruits, you have to go all the way back to those feasts in Leviticus and back to the events of that night that they left Egypt to understand what's going on here. I found something that fascinated me this week in study. Joshua has taken the people across the Jordan and it it says... And the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. The next verse says, and they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. Unleavened cakes, parched corn in the selfsame day. But look at verse 16. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Here they are in succession again. 14th Passover. 15th unleavened bread. 16th first fruits. I've asked people for years, 
asking them, let's let's use scripture to explain scripture. In other words, I I don't want to hear what you heard on Christian television. I, I I I don't want you to repeat to me something that you found on some obscure website. I'm not asking you to tell me what your pastor taught or what your priest taught or what, no. Let's just use Bible to explain Bible. Is there a place in the Bible that actually tells us what the gospel is? And the answer is obvious. It's in Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is the gospel in the Bible? Death, burial, resurrection. That's the gospel. And it's vitally important when you read this verse. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes, we'll start with the Jews and then we'll get to the Gentiles. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be saved, you must obey the gospel. Because the gospel is the power to save you. This is more than a mental assent and a simple acceptance of historical events. Do you believe there is a God? Do you believe his name is Jesus? Do you believe he died for your sins? This is about obedience. We must do more than simply agree that he died and he rose again on the third day. We must be willing to enter into a covenant relationship that identifies him as our Lord and we as his servants. Because Jesus taught in John chapter 15, the servant is never greater than the Lord. No wonder he also said in Matthew 7 and verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? If you read on later, he'll say, depart from me. I don't even know who you are. Even though they said, Lord, Lord, because in Luke 6 and verse 46, Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? It's very simple. You can't call him Lord if you aren't willing to obey what he asks you to do. We're supposed to be his servants, and no servant is exempt from the actions and request of their Lord. In other words, if he did it, we need to do it. If he asks for it, we need to obey it. He died, we must die. He was buried, we must be buried. He resurrected, we must be resurrected. Thus you will find verses like this in Acts 17 and verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now, now, God commands all men everywhere to repent. That's dying out to yourself, ladies and gentlemen. If you identify with his death through repentance, Jesus didn't just die on the cross. They put him in the grave. We need to identify with his burial. According to Romans 6 and 4, we are buried with him by baptism. Jesus was not just dead and buried, but resurrected from the grave. Therefore, in Romans 8 and 11, it says, if the spirit of him 
that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead is going to raise you up from the dead. Quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. How do you identify with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? By repenting. How do you identify with his burial? By being baptized in water in his name. How do you identify with his resurrection? Filled with the Holy Spirit. So filled that it literally burglarizes your speech. And you magnify your creator in a language you don't know. But he understands perfectly. That's power, ladies and gentlemen. That's real power. That's a real transformation. It's what the Bible calls a new birth. Rise to walk in newness of life, it says. What I'm trying to show you is that this thing begins with Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. Jesus is called our Passover. John the Baptist introduced Jesus as the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. Just as the blood of that lamb in the Old Testament was splashed on your house and specifically on your door and he would pass over you. That's what repentance does. That's what Passover is. Passover is the picture of the death of the lamb which you and I identify with through our repentance. Unleavened bread, no leaven, no yeast, nothing has risen. That's why Jesus can't resurrect on the day after he dies because he said, destroy this temple and in three days, not two, three days, I will raise it up. As Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the heart of the earth. The 14th is Passover. The next day is the grave. The next day is the burial. The next day is unleavened bread. Nothing's risen. Nothing rises on the day after Calvary. That's why the third day is so powerful because Paul literally refers to him as the first fruits of them that slapped because first fruits in the Old Testament was the feast that commemorated the greatest jailbreak in the history of the world to that point. But when you get to Jesus coming out of the grave by his own power, that eclipses every jailbreak there's ever been. What I'm trying to show you is those three feasts in the Old Testament, a Passover on 14, unleavened bread on 15, first fruits on 16, are fulfilled in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And not only are they fulfilled in Jesus, they are fulfilled in the church that when we identify with his dying through our repentance and we identify with his burial through our baptism and we identify with his resurrection by being filled with the Holy Spirit, it makes that old New Testament come together, man. It's dovetails. Bible says it fitly framed together. What fascinates me is is that the whole thing begins with Passover. And if you know your Bible, and you know even today, if you've ever been around an Orthodox, you know, you get in business and they have, there's a calendar year and then there's a business year. It's not the same thing, man. And when you deal with Orthodox Jews, January don't mean that much to an Orthodox Jew. But when you get into the spring of the year, what we would call Abib or April, March sometimes, depending on the calendar. I'm telling you that up until Exodus 12, (laughs) that was the fourth month of the year. But he said, when you get into Canaan and you celebrate this feast, it's not going to be April. This month, which has previously been your fourth month, is now going to be the first month of the year. In other words, in the eyes of the Lord, the year begins when you repent. 
That's what God calls a new year. Repentance is so powerful. There's a scripture in Luke 15 where Jesus taught, and of course he would know. He said, angels rejoice when somebody repents. <laughs> How many angels are there anyway? The Bible in Hebrews calls it an innumerable company of angels. I've tried in attempts before to try and show you how many I think there are, but that's just me. Hebrews said, you can't number them. Satan can't create demons. Demons are nothing more than fallen angels, but we serve the creator. He can make more. He can make more. He can make more. You understand, angels never die. There's someone possibly in this room this year. You were in the worst trial of your life. And the very angel that kicked Simon Peter while he was sleeping in prison. That's how worried he was in prison. He went to sleep. The angel kicked him and said, let's go, boy. We're getting out of here. You may have been in a fiery furnace, but the very angel that turned the trio into a quartet, <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I heard Flip Wilson years ago preaching. He said, you know them three big, them three Hebrew boys in the furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and a big Negro. That's what he said. <laughs> Ever been in a fiery furnace? They never saw the fourth one. But he was there. Yes. Is it possible that this year the very same angel that was with them boys in that fire was with you? Is it possible that the very same angel that was with Daniel in the lion's den was with you. Wow. <laughs> Paul one time said, there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord. He didn't stop the shipwreck, but he was with me and kept me floating all night long. A night and a day, he said, we treaded water in the deep. I've heard people say for years, the will of God is the most important thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. And I'll prove it to you. Because the Bible says in the book of Peter, it's not his will that any should perish. But a lot of them are. It's not his will that any should perish. This is his will. That all should come to repentance. Look at Nineveh. God saw their works. You've got to understand. <laughs> Jonah hates Nineveh. Hates them. God saw their works. That they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. Matthew or Brian, you can find this verse. It's in the end of the book of Jonah. If you know the story of Jonah, Jonah got so depressed when God forgave that city. The king fasted, families fasted, the babies fasted, even the animals, the dogs, the cats, and the cows fasted. And God heard their prayer. Jonah got so depressed, he went and found a shade tree. And all the leaves in the shade tree shriveled up and dried. And he's just sitting there baking in the sun. And this is what he, and God's questioned him, what are you so depressed about? And he said this, I knew. I knew. If I preached repentance to them people and they obeyed, I knew 
you'd forgive them. Hallelujah. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, the men of Nineveh will rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. How long does it take to repent anyway? Let me tell you about a man named David who had an affair with his best friend's wife. She got pregnant. He saw to it that his best friend died in order to cover up his affair. He's an adulterer and he's a murderer. And a prophet by the name of Nathan confronts him and says, you're the thief. You're the thief. Listen to what David does. In 2 Samuel 12 and 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. <laughs> and Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath put away thy sin, and thou shalt not die. You want to know how long it takes to repent? David did it in one verse. Because man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. It doesn't take a lot of words if you really mean them. You don't have to be around this altar for days and days and days and do all kinds of penance and jump through all kinds of hoops. If you really mean it, God's got a meter. And that thing goes, whew. This time they mean it. This time it's for real. See, there's two things in the Old Testament that there was no sacrifice for. You get into those commandments and if you lied, you could offer a sacrifice for that. If you lusted, you, you could offer a sacrifice for that. You dishonored your mom and dad or you stole something, you could offer a sacrifice for that. But there was no sacrifice for murder. And there was no sacrifice for adultery. And that explains this verse in Psalms 51, known as David's prayer of repentance after Nathan confronted him. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. If I could have offered some kind of animal and that would have got my forgiveness, I would have done it. But you know and I know there's no sacrifice for what I did. But the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. If I could have sacrificed something else or someone else, but that's not going to fix it. I'm going to have to sacrifice myself. I'm going to have to put my will on the altar. Look with new eyes with me for a moment at the ministry of Jesus. Nobody got the Holy Ghost while Jesus was preaching. With the exception of his 12 he didn't baptize anybody else. What was the ministry of Jesus? What did he do in those three and a half years? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He delivered the oppressed. He showed mercy to a woman still buttoning up her blouse as they drug her in front of him the woman that's been divorced five times and now shacking up with number six at the well. I'm telling you the ministry of Jesus was not a ministry of baptism in his name nor people being filled with his spirit. But his ministry was one of healing, miracles, deliverance, and mercy. No wonder it says at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 9, two blind men followed him and said, Jesus, watch, thou son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> Do 
So did the Gentile woman, not even a Jew, pleading for her daughter's healing. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. I read to you from Matthew 9, which is the beginning of his ministry. But now I read to you from Matthew 20, which is at the end of the ministry, which tells me it's another duet. Two more blind guys. It says in 20 and 31, and the multitude rebuked him or rebuked them. These, these, these blind guys are screaming. What are they screaming? Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. They tried to shut him up. So what did they do? They screamed even louder. Do you understand what I'm saying to you right now? There are only a few select times in the New Testament when that phrase is used, son of David. The only one that could be called the son of David was Messiah. So when they said Jesus, son of David, they're not just saying, hey, you, 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 the guy from Nazareth. They're not, they're not, they don't just know his name. They know his identity. They know who he is. He's Messiah. <laughs> He's Savior. Don't you get it? When the enemy tries to shut you, I'm telling you in this time, the enemy's going to do everything they can to try and stifle the message of the mighty God in Christ. Our response has got to be the same. We got to preach it louder. We got to shout it louder and longer. Jesus, I don't just know your name. I know who you are. <laughs> Hallelujah. Two blind men at the beginning, two blind men at the end. This is why Bartimaeus in Mark 10 See, Jesus is on his way coming out of Jericho. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's never coming back. Bartimaeus, Bar means son of, Timaeus means blind man. Bartimaeus is second generation blind. They're used to blind guys in that family. The boy's blind, daddy's blind. But Bartimaeus said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. What does it say? It said the crowd, even his disciples, tried to get him to shut up. But he had learned from the blind guys. Don't stop now. And he cried even yet the more, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Look, I, I, I'm almost done. Look, look at how the ministry of Jesus begins. How does it begin? It's in Luke chapter four. In Luke chapter four, Jesus reads Isaiah 61, which is about the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, people got their form back. Every day of the year, somebody got something back that they had lost 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, 49 years ago. The whole year was a time of celebration. Hey, hey man, hey Mike, man, I'm really glad to see you got the farm back. And he said, Harold, your, your, your day's coming in two weeks. You know, in two weeks, that's your day. You lost it three years after I lost mine, but this is Jubilee year. And every day of the year, on that day that you lost the farm, you got back something that you thought you would never, ever have in your possession again. Jesus said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. You know what he's saying? You're never gonna have to wait 50 years again for Jubilee. I'm Jubilee. I'm setting you free. You're never going to have to wait again to get back what you lost. That's how his ministry began. Look how his ministry ended. The Bible calls him our great high priest. If you know the Old Testament, there are six cities of refuge. And if you committed manslaughter, you could run to a city of refuge and you had one of two ways out. If you could get two or three witnesses to stand up for you and prove your innocence, you'd get exonerated and delivered. But if you couldn't find two or three eyewitnesses that you really didn't mean to harm anybody, you had to wait for the death of the high priest. And when the high priest died, everybody confined in those six cities of refuge got to go home for Thanksgiving, got to go home for Christmas dinner. I, I've had a great week this week. My kids came from Texas. We were all there. Mother was there. Renee and I and Ashley and Brittany and Josh and Cameron and Parker. And I, it, it, it's, it's the second Christmas we've ever had without daddy, but, 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 but it was just so good 
to, to have all my kids around and my mom still alive. And, and I think of people who had been in a city of refuge for God knows how long. But all of a sudden, you know, it's like the Catholics right now. You know, Benedict just died. It's, just, it's, it's very similar. It's like, guess what? The high priest checked out last night. Are you kidding? No sooner do they say that and they're packing their Samsonite, man, because they're going back home to be with their family. You know what I'm trying to show you? The ministry of Jesus began with freedom. The ministry of Jesus began with restoration. I tell you, the same way it began is the same way it ended. He freed people when he died. When the high priest died, he freed them. Not only did his ministry begin with freedom and end with freedom, I'm telling you all the way through the thing. It was freedom, emancipation, restoration, deliverance. (laughs) So listen as I close. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Give me my verse up here, scripture man. Romans 8 and 28. To them who are called according to, it doesn't say that. It says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the, the called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. You get what I'm saying. We don't want A. We want V. I don't want A revival. I'm praying for the revival. I, I, I don't want a harvest. I, I'm believing for the harvest. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because we are not called. We are the called. We are the called. So all of you listening to me on this live stream, I believe a quarter of a million dollars will be given to imagine from the people who aren't in this building on a Sunday, but who watch us from various places around the country and around the world. A dime of it doesn't go in my pocket. I'm asking you to stand with us. I'm asking you to sacrifice with us. I believe that. Why? Because the Bible said there's the former rain and there's the latter rain. But he said, in that day, I'm going to give you the rain. I'm going to give you the former and the latter together. I'm going to give you a gutter washer. I'm going to give you an outpouring like no one in this world has ever known. That's why we're coming again tomorrow night and we're going to do it again and again. I can't imagine the things that are going to be straightened and changed because of our days of fasting. There are some things that don't come out except you pray and fast. People that don't pray and fast, I'm not saying they can't be saved, but I am saying that there are things that are forever excluded from their lives. They'll never see those kind of ministries. They'll never see those kind of miracles. They'll never never see those kids change. They'll never see that story change. They'll never see it. But people that fast and pray, this kind that we're dealing with right now, it will go out with prayer and fasting. And that's why this is your chance. This is your shot. Don't be lost because of your pride. Don't be lost because of your stubbornness. The Bible said rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. And I'll tell you why. Because you worship your own will. Repent. This is the first day of the year. I don't care what the calendar says. I care what the Christ says. When does he say a new year begins? Passover. Putting that blood on your life. Real, true, genuine, heartfelt repentance. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Solomon called himself the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes. I personally think he was a backslid preacher because this is what he said. There's nothing new under the sun. It's all vanity. Boy, was he wrong. (laughs) 
there was a new king coming. And that new king was going to have a new message and a new covenant. He said, this is the New Testament given to you in my blood. And you get what Ezekiel called a new heart and a new spirit. And you'll speak with new tongues. (laughs) Making what Paul called a new man gives you a new life that's why the Bible said you're going to sing unto him a a new song a new and living way going to a new Jerusalem where he's going to write upon you a new name and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and no wonder at the end of the Bible it simply says behold I make all things new Go get, go get your children from the nursery. They, let's, let's do this as a family. I'm, I'm not here to build up a, a straw man and tear somebody else apart. You don't get a positive response from a negative base. I'm not here to beat up somebody else's religion to promote mine. I just know there are people that do this thing week after week after week. I'm sure not to all of them, but to many of them, it's just mundane and they just take it for granted. We, we try to be very careful about this communion thing because it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Ah, oh, Jesus. Am I preaching to somebody right now? you got secret sackcloth in your life. Am I preaching to somebody right now that your wife doesn't know what you're doing, sir? Your husband doesn't know what you're doing, ma'am. Son, you think you've you fooled your mom and dad. You think you're doing it and they don't know. Let me give you a Bible verse. A bird of the air will carry it to them. I'll tell you what the Bible said. You do it in secret without repentance long enough. It's going to be revealed openly. But you you got a chance right now. You got a relationship that you shouldn't have? Is there a non-growth relationship in your life? Sir, do you have a a friend that you tell your wife, ah, there's nothing to it. She's just my friend. Ma'am, do you tell your husband, there's nothing to this? Am I preaching to somebody right now that's got a pornography problem? Yes, I am. Am I preaching to someone right now that's got a problem telling the truth? Probably. But right now, (laughs) right now, in this magic moment, we have the ability to pray a real prayer of repentance. It doesn't take long. It's just got to be real. The Bible doesn't say he'll save you in your sin. It said he'll save you from your sin. Which means run. (laughs) Run for your life. I got teenagers in this room right now. I can put my finger on your nose. You're in real trouble. You got your mom and dad scared to death. You got your pastor terrified. You think you know more than we do. You think it's not going to happen to you. You see this lack of hair on the top of my head and this gray hair on the side. I've been down this road a time or two. I'm begging you as your pastor. I'm begging you right now. You got a habit you need to stop. You got a hobby that's stealing your joy. You got something that's burglarizing, amen, your hope. Do you have a secret sin in your life that every time it seems like you're just about to break over into a new covenant with the Lord, 
that old thing pops up again like whack-a-mole at Chuck E. Cheese and shows its ugly head only for the enemy to, to torment you and say, see there, you're never going to get out of my clutches. You're never going to get out of my control. Rome, 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 Rome. This is what the Lord calls a new day. A new day. It's a little complicated. You got to do it with your fingernail. But if you bend that thing down, there's a little piece of clear plastic on the top of this. If you peel it off, there's a little wafer underneath of that. Will you stand with me now? Amen. Don't open the other just yet. We got to do the most important part. We got to repent right now. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I really am. My wife thinks she knows me. My mom thinks she knows me. My dad thought he knew me. Nobody knows you like you. You do. Your word says, I don't even know my own heart. I don't even know what that heart of mine is capable of. There are hundreds of thousands of people in prisons in this country who in their craziest, craziest moments never believed they would be the one that did what they did. But I know there's something called cords of sin. Cords. I know that Delilah's barber shop is still open. And I know she'll wrap one thing around us and we'll break it and we'll wrap another thing around us and we'll break it. But if we stay in that barber shop too long, Sooner or later, the enemy's going to wrap one too many strands around our spirit. We're not going to get free. Oh, Jesus. I can't do this without you. I, I can't do this without you. I can't be the husband I need to be. I can't be the daddy I need to be. I can't be the son I'm supposed to. I can't be the, the brother. I can't be the pastor. I I. I can't do this without your help. I'm asking you humbly, Lord, to hear my prayer of repentance. And I don't want to live in such pride and arrogance and be so caught up in my image that I think, no, I could never admit to that. People would think less of me. What matters is what do you think of me, God? How do you view us right now? There are no secrets with you, Lord. You know what lodges in my mind. You know what comes out of my mouth. You know my habits, my hobbies, my pastimes. You know what I'm like when no one else is there. You know what I'm like when I'm in the dark. I'm asking you, God, right now. I want this to be a legitimate re-year of renewal and repentance and restoration. I want to be thee called. I want to see thee revival in the church. I want to see thee re harvest of the lost. Forgive me, Lord. I've had words come out of my mouth that are so far beneath the dignity of someone who would dare call themselves a child of God. You said sweet water and bitter water are, can never come out of the same well, but they've come out of my mouth. I've allowed things to lodge in my spirit, God, that were wrong. I got mad at people that I should have not got mad at. I've had attitudes inside of me, Lord, that are so far beneath love and joy and long-suffering and gentleness. Goodness, mercy. <laughs> Shepherd's got to lead these sheep right now. Preacher's got to lead the people. We repent before you right now, Lord Jesus. Oh, God. What good's a new building going to do if we don't have a new consecration in our lives? We'll have a name that we're alive, but we're really dead. You said, I try. I ask you to go tried in the fire. Laodicea, you're famous for your eyes, Sav. Now get some of that and lay it on your eyes and let the eyes of your understanding be in light. Lord Jesus, I make a covenant today in this room. I'm going to be the man I've always wanted to be, but as of yet, I have never been. I'm going to be the woman 
that I know you called me to be and as of now I've never been that woman I'm going to be the husband that I know in my heart I can be the kind sacrificing husband that I know I can be Lord I'm going to be the meek submitted wife that I know that I can be Lord I'm going to be the obedient son and the obedient daughter and I know in my heart you called me to be and Lord we're going to be the praying sacrificing and worshiping church that you've called us we're not a great church we're a good church we're not a great church I'm asking you God this this communion sir this day is the watershed mark in our life. I'm never going back to who I used to be. Hear my prayer. Accept my forgiveness and my, my repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would with me to take this it's just a simple wafer, but this is an ancient rite that we're going through right now. Jesus did this with his disciples. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take this cup, peel that second thing back. Put that in your mouth, if you would, with that wafer. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Daddy, if you can, put your hand on your wife. Put your hand on your kids. Come with me around this altar. If your dad's not here, I'm asking somebody else in this church, join yourself to someone else. Got a lot of teachers, not a lot of fathers. Is there someone in this church that you respect? Is there someone in this church that you know, you know, they're righteous men and they're righteous women? Go get by that man. Go get by that woman. Everybody should be a part, not just of this church family, but of a, real families around this altar right now. Let's have an adoption ceremony, a real fast one right now. I need you to adopt some kids right now into the safety of your family. In Jesus' name. <laughs> now, Daddy, I want you to put your hand. Don't take a long time because we don't have a long time. Pray for your wife. Pray for your son. Pray for your daughters. Amen. You might have grandchildren here. There, there, there may there be, be a boy or a girl here. It's not your blood family, but you're adopting them into your family right now. Amen. Single moms right now that aren't going to leave this service as a single mom, but they're going to be sisters. Amen. The people in this church family right now legitimate covenant family members. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, God. I don't want to lose a one. I don't want to lose a one. Not a one. Not one more teenager. Not one more family. Not another divorce. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Let the foundation of the Word of God be beneath our feet right now. Build a heads of protection around this family right now as we submit ourselves to the canopy of submission. Oh, Lord. Lord. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That's right, Daddy. Get anointed right now. I can't hear many daddies. Come on, lift up your voice, daddy. 
Let your boy hear you pray. Let your girl hear you pray. When's the last time your wife really, really heard you pray? Really, really pray. I'm talking a real one. I'm talking about an anointed one right now. Your family's on the line, Daddy. <laughs> Tomorrow's on the line right now. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. 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 You're watching us online right now. I'm asking you, sir, would you pray for your wife? If your family's there, would you pray? Husband and wife, would you grab hands and pray with us right now? This is a God that can eclipse time and distance. That means nothing to him. Today is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. Ten thousand miles is ten feet with him. Amen. Distance means nothing. He can eclipse and override all of that. In the name of Jesus right now. Let the people in this building and First Church at large, around this nation, around this world, I'm asking you, God, to bind and band and bond us together right now. It is something amazing, something powerful, something life-changing, something Satan-threatening. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, nothing. Nothing. Come on, Daddy. The wife didn't do it. The kids didn't do it. It was that dad that grabbed that sheath. Amen. Dipped it in that blood, splashed it on that door. Cover your house with the blood. Cover your family with the... <laughs> in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Make your request known with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for my family. Thank you for my brother. Thank you for my sister. Thank you for my daughter, my son, my wife. Thank you for my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my great-grandfather. I thank you, God, for my nieces, my nephews. I thank you for my sons and daughters, my grandsons, my granddaughters. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Let's offer thanksgiving unto him right now. Satan hates this, ladies and gentlemen. Satan is terrified, but angels rejoice. Angels rejoice. There are people repenting here today for the first time. There are sins that have been repented of here today for the first time. Secret sins, hidden sins, things that they thought nobody else knew. They've been repented of here around this altar for the first time. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. That's powerful. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing is more appealing to the truth than when you tell the truth. Whether it's bad or good, doesn't matter. Just tell the truth, be honest. And he said, that's my boy there. That's my boy. How in the world and what kind of life did he live? For the Lord to literally recommend Job to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? He's perfect and upright in all of his ways. Wow. In Jesus' name. This is a heavy day. I don't want to end it heavy. I'm going to ask Draylon, we're going to sing a song of rejoicing and thanksgiving and worship. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what God calls a new year. January 1, January 1 means nothing to Jesus if there's no repentance there. If there, if there it means nothing to him. But I'm telling you, the fourth month can become the first month. <laughs> if you're smart enough to realize the value of putting his blood on your life, and dying out to your own will. Sing us something, boy. These kids are hungry, they're tired, they've had a long day. So we're going to sing together and then we're going to go home.
General Motors can't do this, ladies and gentlemen. Dodge and Chrysler can't do this. Ford will never be able to. Tesla and all the electronic geniuses, and they're going to do this. Only God can make a year. This is a day the Lord has made. The Bible said His mercies are new every day. So what are you going to do with 23? What do you say we make this the greatest year of victory <laughs> and personal growth we've ever known? I want to give Satan, they used to say, do you, do you have a headache or do you have an excedrin headache? I'd like to give Satan an excedrin headache, a really bad one. Have you come to torment us before our time? Yep, yep we have, yep we have. It's been an honor to be in church and make this covenant with you today. Let's leave this place to serve him as new men and new women, new sons, new daughters, new marriages, new families, new relationships. I love you. God bless you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Go and sin no more.